Those who keeps the workflow tight Efficiency and value I say every single night Risk profiles They got a man It's no joke North America's the stage And they never choke Metrics on point Updated without fail Chameleon carriers They're on the trail Don't play with a safe companies Don't be that guy He carry your checks Keeping you safe Under the sky 40 plus filters With the search That can drive Carry your information in the FMCSA archive. Find your carrier with precision and needs. Location equipment feeds. They got the keys. FTL the shipper leads. They're right there for you. Real time authorities, what they do. Crazy breezy ultimates. The dashboards away. Freedom from low boards. They got it every day. You carry your checks. The architect leading the way. What is going on? Good morning. Welcome to the E-Carrier Check Show. Excited to be here, man. Uh, we've got a, an exciting guest today, uh, Will Jenkins. He's going to bring the house early later uh, as we go, and I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more of who he is and what he's doing and his passions in life. Uh, but, Nate, man, I know you have been just running the ship this week, brother. How's how's the week been? Yeah, like, been tell, a, me, tell me about it. It's been a really good week. I know with you kind of on the road this week, kind of just stirring the business, I, I had a more chance to answer more phone calls, mm. kind of just dive deep into some meetings, mm. uh, just kind of hear where freight brokers are, are um, today and, the, you know, talking about the market, you know, just trying to help people uh, just kind of get to meet their goals. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's been a really good week. Can't complain. Yeah. I, you know, the obvious thing is, you know, economy, people are going out of business. Yeah. You just constantly are seeing, you know, the, the, the negative side of this. So oh, yeah. uh, trying yeah. to control the controllables and, and at least be there to be upbeat. You know what I mean? Exactly. So um, I appreciate you keep, you know, steering that shit. So, so we do, man. So, we so do. Um, today we got Will Jenkins on. I'm excited to have you on. Will, welcome to the show, man. What's going on? What's up guys? How we doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm good. good. How's, uh, how's your week been? been really busy but productive enjoying some nice weather here in chicago we've got a long fall which is not always the case so i'm pretty happy yeah uh, anytime you get 60 degrees in the midwest it's like shorts and t-shirts yeah, stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. well great. man you've got an incredible background i'm yes. excited to hear about you you know for for those that may not understand who you who you are and how you've grown what you've done man give us just a quick little taste of what you've been doing the last yeah. you know five six years totally so i'll go back to when i got into transportation i got into transportation about a year and a half after i graduated from illinois wesleyan so this would have been january of 2014 i had a couple of friends that worked at coyote logistics and they were friends of mine from a previous job they were in business development sales at coyote doing really well and making good money. I said, man, you know, it seems like you guys have something good going on there. So I interviewed for a carrier sales role, joined Coyote in January of 14, spent two years on the carrier sales side, which I loved. We had a chance to speak a couple of weeks ago. You guys know I'm pretty high energy, competitive, things of that nature. And so for me, getting an opportunity to join an organization like Coyote and spend time developing a book of business and making good money based on being able to produce, I was like, this is perfect, you know, really cool environment. It was great. I spent two years on the carrier side, and then in January of 2016, I moved over to manage a group of shipper-facing sales reps. So they're calling on customers across the country, helping to essentially market our services and figure out ways to move their freight, full truckload, intermodal, LTL, all that good stuff. Um, so that was really cool. Most of my skill set is in shipper-facing sales, coaching and mentoring sales reps. It's what I've done most of my career, and I loved it. I was like, man, this is where I should be. I, I you know, I got to be on the shipper-facing side. It's a blast. Um, I spent a year or so doing that at Coyote. I got recruited really heavily by Transport America uh, in the fall of 2016. Prior to that, they had recently purchased a freight brokerage, Optimal Freight, which was uh, Noam Frankel's company. Um, so I had a chance to go and join Transport America, get on the asset side. So, you know, coming from Coyote, never really had a chance to sell assets. So it was really cool to learn what that part was like. Um, yeah. I was, I was uh, Transport America's director of business development on the brokerage side. Um, help build out that team. And then in April of 2017, um, I did what most, I guess, like mid 20 somethings do when you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your career. I took a backpacking trip to Europe. Um, during that time, I listened to Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, which is my favorite book. I also really love Nike and, you know, the origin story is really interesting. So yeah. I went to Switzerland and Sweden, Copenhagen, Denmark, Berlin, all these places. And I'm listening to Shoe Dog. 
um, you know, getting really inspired about opportunities to build businesses. And when I got back to the States, I actually met with one of my business partners um, who I'd worked with previously, Andrew Silver, who is son of Jeff Silver. We worked together at Coyote. So all of us um, actually worked for Jeff when we were there. And uh, we started talking about what it would be like to start an organization like Molo. Um, and I said, man, forget it. You know, I'm, I'm in. I'll, I'll leave Transport America tomorrow. We can you know, figure this out and get going. So I left uh, Transport America and started working on Molo in April of 2017. Um, we had two other partners, Stephen Mathis, who is our top sales uh, rep during the duration of us being at Molo, and then Matt Bogrich, who was our president, and he was um, friends with Andrew from college. Um, so we launched Molo in July of 2017. Um, Andrew had a non-compete, so he had to sit it out for about a year uh, until his non-compete was over. So he joined us in April of 2018. Um, but I spent the last six years um, helping build and scale Molo Solutions, which was an incredible journey. Um, we'll dig in there as you guys ask more questions, but a little bit about how I got to where I'm at and you know, we'll, we'll dig in some more. I freaking love that, what man. Journey. That's insane. Yeah. Charles Money, what's up, brother? Hey, Welcome, Charles. I'm glad you're on. Uh, yeah, as long as you guys are watching, obviously uh, feel free to, to throw out questions. Uh, as Will is is truly, here's what I love about you, Will. This is why we reached out to you, is you bring the house when it comes to LinkedIn content material. I love potentially, and I'd be curious of, of to know the backstory of this, but honestly, when did you figure out that you were such a leader? You know, I, I got I to gotta read a couple of these, man. Like, it's like, here, here's one of your posts. Shout out to those people who keep battling in the face of adversity. It gets better, but only if you persist, right? I love that. Don't let someone else's lack of vision stop you from going after what you want. You know, stop acting like tomorrow's guaranteed and get started today. Uh, you know, every day you are my breath of fresh air. I get a drinky while we go. I get to go. I go, what's Will Jenkins got to say? And yeah. if you don't post, I get kind of pissy at you. I, yeah. I like, I start stomping around the office. It's not good. You know what I mean? But when, at what point in your journey, obviously you were, you, were you a leader in high school? Were you a leader yeah. in college? When did you just start to kind of take it on and go, man, I'm going to bring the house. I think there are a couple of important milestones in my life that helped me to become a leader. First is probably from sports. So I played football in college. I've been an athlete my entire life. I was captain of every sport I played. So football, wrestling, track, I'm just very used to stepping up and finding opportunities to lead people. But what I learned is that if you're going to try to influence a group, you have to be willing to put the work in to get them to want to work with you and, and do things. And so I think what I learned in high school and then playing football in college, you know, same things translate it, right? You know, you're in the gym early you're doing as much as you can to stay ahead of the pack, right? People are competitive. They want to do well. But if you want the younger class, so, you know, you're a senior and you want the freshmen and sophomore and juniors to work hard, you better be bringing the heat. And so what I realized is that that translates the same to business, right? People want to work with and be parts of organizations where they see leadership that's willing to roll their sleeves up and go do the work. So a lot of that stuff came from, from sports. And then I was fortunate enough at a young age to get a really, really good job at 18. So I actually used to sell Cutco kitchen cutlery for anyone that's familiar. And it was a direct sales job commission only. And what it taught me was, look, I got to go close, right? Like if you're not closing, you're not making any money. So very interesting role to have at a young age. But the mentors that I had there were incredible. So they were giving me really good books to read, mindset type stuff, goal setting type things. And then they gave me the opportunity to interview train and manage sales reps at 18. I'm like, this is nuts, right? I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't think, <laughs> but you all are very successful and you're willing to give me an opportunity to go and learn. And then throughout my time in college, it, it was the company's Cutco Vector Marketing was the only job I had. And every summer I would come back and learn more. So I managed an office for them. And then I moved up and ran my own office in Lincoln Park when I was 20. So this was the summer of 2006 going into my junior year of college and you know having the opportunity to be exposed to business at a large scale very young i think helped me become a leader because when i was 20 years old i had 80 sales reps and three full-time receptionists and the office that i ran did one hundred ten thousand dollars in revenue and i'm like this is crazy right like i don't know how we got here like this is just you know a, a nut setup but the organization you know to go back to your original question taught me so much about 
if you want to lead people, you have to be willing to do the work and you have to have the right mindset that makes people want to align and, and, and want to go to, you know, battle with you every day. Mm, for sure. I love that. You, you had to cut your teeth at a very young age. You know, at 18, you had that sales job, right? And, you know, obviously you probably dealt with some good phone calls, bad phone calls, especially in this market today. That's really my phone calls with freight brokers are like every day. I can't every get day. a show. I got hung up today, you know, five times oh, yeah. or mm -hmm. some lady told me to F off, right? That's kind of what I hear Wait. on the phone like every day. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny. I remember being 18 years old, making my first sales calls two days into training selling Cutco. And I went to a really small school, uh, Walter Lutheran. It's a small private school on the west side of Chicago. So we had like 400 students. So 100 students in each class. You know, everybody like I went to physics and, you know, track practice with all these kids and I'm making cold calls. I'm calling from a high school directory. I'm like, hey, you know, this is well, you know, I went to high school with your son or daughter and I'm, you know, I got this new job trying to set up appointments. Click. I'm like, what? what? Like, oh you don't want to buy your knives. I'm like, oh, my God, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> but like it taught me so much about not taking no personally and yeah. how to battle through just, you know, hey, not everybody's going to want to work with you and you can't take that personal. It's not that you're bad doesn't mean that you don't provide value like timing means a lot and so similar to like you're saying with the market today you're going to call customers you're going to try to work with shippers and carriers that you want to build relationships with and sometimes they won't be receptive you can't let that take you off your game oh sure. yeah. yeah yeah i'm reading um i'm listening to this book i, I have a hard time reading uh, in in front of me but i listen to a lot and um it's talking about how the fish can't see water right and I, it's if you think about it you know the fish go through the water. They have really no idea that they're probably in water uh, in some regards. Right. And, and it's a leadership book on, on, you know, I don't know why I'm li listening to a young leadership book, but that's beside the point. Um, I, I'm a lot older than you think. I just, age Nonsense. Well. yeah, I just <laughs> age well. And my mind tells me I'm like 19, but you know, over the years, you taking on such a large leadership role at such a young age, you know, when, uh, what was the, probably the hardest lesson you learned or when was a time you kind of got drugged through the mud that really changed Ooh. the way your leadership skills sort of elevated? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would, I would give two examples. The first one would be during my first summer managing an office for Cutco on my own. So I was a branch manager for the summer of 2006. I had, like I said, 80 sales reps that worked in my office and three receptionists. There was a time in the summer where I ran out of money. So I'll give the backstory for it. When you run a branch office, you, you had, you're a 1099 contractor, but it's like being a franchise, right? So you're responsible for paying your rent, you know, buying phones, getting supplies, setting the office up. And the summer before that, I saved a bunch of money to be able to go out on my own and start this office, right? Uh, so I, you know, budget, I pay my rent up front because no landlord thinks a 19 or 20 year old has enough money to pay for, you know, an office rent. So they're like, you gotta pay for it up front. So did all that stuff. And I remember the office was performing okay, but not exceptionally well. And I actually ran out of cash. So I, you know, paid my receptionist all the money that I had. And I pick up the phone, I call my district manager and I'm like, look, Mike, I don't know what I'm gonna do because I can't make payroll next week for my receptionist. And I like, I've never been in this position. and. Um, essentially what he said was, you know, you're going to figure it out. He's one of the best leaders I've ever worked with, you know, taught me a ton. Um, and from that point on, what I learned is that in the midst of what's most challenging, you have to be willing to put your head down and go do what it is that is hardest, even when you don't think there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And so from that point on, my office exploded. We probably did 50 or 60 grand, which was more than we had done all summer in like a two or three week period. And I think the reason was because I started getting rid of all the excuses and just said, you have no other choice but to go perform. And I think that helped the people that were on my team realize that you just got to go out and do it on a daily basis. Um, the other example I would use would just be generally scaling Molo. It was such a challenging thing to do because none of us had ever built a freight brokerage. We'd have been part of a very large organization like a Coyote or you know, come from other really strong organizations. But when you're sitting in a desk and you're working through covering challenging loads or adding new customers or working through rejection because certain enterprise shippers don't want to work with you, the people around you respond how you respond. So if you are despondent and 
man, you know, woe is me, it's not working out. That's how they're gonna respond to that adversity. And I think what I learned was it's okay to not feel great about how things are working out, but your people need to understand that you're willing to work through that and stay positive in the midst of the challenges. So I'm not saying like blowing smoke, everything's perfect. You know, this is challenging, but we have to be willing to, you know, call and stay on the phone and work through these challenges together. Um, because when you're building your book of business, you're going to respond to these challenges the same way you see us responding to them as leaders. So I think that taught me a lot because it wasn't easy. Like the first two years were so hard. Um, nobody knows who you are. You don't have a brand. You don't have any credit. They don't want to work with you. There's really no reason for them to onboard you. So you have to be really persistent. Um, I think that taught a lot about leadership. Yeah, I love that. Uh, we've got a couple people in the audience here. Uh, Thomas, what's up, brother? This guy's from London, actually. I love this guy. He runs a cool software yeah. uh, technology that, that I'm a big fan of. You might have to drop the name of your software in the, in the comments. But he asks you, what what what's the, what's one of your most recommended books, Will, that you've read? I really enjoy The Power of Habit, which is this yellow book right here. Yeah. Um, I probably read it twice a year. I also am a big audiobook guy, so I use Audible to listen to different things. But what I like about The Power of Habit is it breaks down certain psychological aspects of how to get yourself to work through things. So let's say you want to build the habit of working out every day at a certain time. Great. You can build in certain functions that, that allow it to make yourself e to make it easier for you to get up and go do your workouts. So I've always worked out and enjoyed it. But you get into the working world and you get a little lazy. I just, I'm not even gonna pull punches. Like you just get yeah. out of the routine of doing it. Um, yeah. And so I, I listened to that book in 2016 when I wanted to, you know, really get back in shape and start working on things. And one of the the you know habits it mentioned is, okay, if you wanna work out, why don't you just put your clothes on for a workout the night before? So you just have less of a reason not to get up and get going. I started doing that and I'm like, Okay, the alarm went off. Just get up and go to the gym. You're already, you know, basically dressed. Uh, just simple stuff like that. But they give really good examples of how to work through setting up habits to make yourself a little bit more efficient. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, that, it's Charles Duhigg, right? Is that? Yeah, uh, Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of that book. In fact, one of my brother's buddies. This is the this is the funniest thing ever. You know, the 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 heaviest weight at the gym is the front door, right? Wow. And yeah. so you know, he, he started to just drive himself to the gym, hang out in the parking lot and sat there for five minutes. And he did this like every day for two weeks. He didn't even go in. He just wanted to get in the habit of driving there after work every day. Finally, he started going in and, and next thing you know, you know, this cat's, he's not ripped, but he's cut. He's getting a little bit more, you know, just healthy at 50 years old. Um, okay. and it, it's such an interesting, uh, and he read that same book. He's like, I just a science, science-based concept of how do I build a habit? How do I stack up little habits to get it going? And that's what he did for two straight weeks. He just kept driving to the gym. It was hilarious. I was like, yeah, I love that. You, so, and, it, and it's important to build those habits like that. You know, like I said, I, I constantly get to hear these brokers stories mm -hmm. or their journeys every day. I'm um, at e-carrier check and I always encourage to have them build a habit, whether it's five calls a day to shippers. Right. Yep. I mean, it's better than no calls in my opinion, but, um, you know, what are some, what's some feedback you can give some of those brokers that are struggling with, uh, you know, creating a habit like that? Like what do you think, um, I guess what helped you, you know, build a good habit? Yeah. So when I got to the shipper facing sales side at Coyote, I spent a ton of time just sitting with the best of the best to understand how they manage their day and how they went about adding new shippers to their book of business. And one of the best conversations I had was with a new up and coming seller that was probably eight to nine months into the role, but, really advanced for where they were. So they had built a sizable book of business, already making some money, you know, had some consistent lanes with shippers. And I was like, man, you know, how do you keep this up month after month? Because I've sat with other peers of yours that seem to plateau and you know, now they're working with the same group and they're not adding new logos on a monthly basis. And what I learned from this rep was the concept of planning your work and then working that plan. So every single day, at the end of the day, this person would build their prospecting list for the next day before they came in so that they didn't really have an excuse not to email or make those cold calls. It was already set up. And then they plan their day to go, okay, typically in the morning, I'm going to have some overnight issues I have to resolve. Fantastic. Like, let me knock that out early. So it doesn't derail me during this next chunk of the day where I'm making my prospecting and 
um, emails and phone calls. Then I'll filter out some bad leads. You know, I reach out to these companies. They weren't a good fit. Sweet. Let's drop them. You know, no matter how well I sell to them, they're never going to be a good fit for our business. So let's get rid of them. Let me add a couple new ones. Great. I'm doing some quotes. I've got some customer calls, meetings, and then I wrap my day up at the end doing the same thing. Let me find my 20 to 25 customers I'm going to reach out to. I think if you put yourself on autopilot, it's easier to just do the work because you don't have a reason not to. I got to call these 25 customers. Cool. Yesterday I said I was going to. They're sitting here on my desk. I'm going to rattle through these 25. I've done the hardest part already. Now let's filter through what's good, add better ones, and keep that process rolling. I think it's just easy to get distracted with busy work as a sales rep because it's there. Oh, issue with a load. Ah, customer needs this invoicing thing. And before you know it, it's like four o'clock. You haven't made any sales calls. Like the most important thing is to make your sales calls. Yeah. Kind of like how you said, put your workout clothes on before, you know, the night before, get up and get ready to get after it, right? Make yeah. that pipeline mm -hmm. the day before, get after it. And by the way, you know, just from your post the other day about not making excuses, you got my butt to the gym, man. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but Jared, we, we got a question for Jared here. Um, it's a really good question. Um, because you make a lot of sales calls I on the show. I do make a lot of cold calls on the show. It's Jerry, kind of entertaining. Why do you open up a sales call? You know, how's your day going? I, I, you know, I've always been, and I'd be kind of curious how Will has done this. He's probably just made just as many cold calls as I have. Yeah. Um, but I've always been one that I, whether I'm talking to the person that answers the phone or the actual decision maker, um, I, I truly actually care. Um, right. And I hope that my voice reflects, mm -hmm. you know, my tone. Uh, the the slowness or or the the way it comes out, you know, is in sort of an empathetic way, um, because I, I do want to know how how's their day going. You know, I it's probably not ideal, right? I mean, if I was on Wolf of Wall Street, I probably need to get a little harder, right? Um, but that was something that worked for me, um, and so it doesn't work for everybody. To be honest with you, there's a lot of things that I do that don't work exactly for everybody. I, I hear about them, believe me. Um, but I, that's kind of what I'm, that's where I'm at when it comes to that opening line. I have been thinking about new opening lines into 2024. Uh, we had a really crazy conversation about this the other day. So we may do some new cold calls and, and try this out. Um, so hang on for that, Michael, but I'd kind of kick this over to Will. Obviously there's the technical side of sales. We don't mm -hmm. have to get crazy here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. I like, so I've been doing cold calls for 15 years. It is just part of the game. You got to pick the phone up and figure out what's going on. I enjoy asking people or if I'm picking up a cold call, hey, how are you? And the reason is not, I won't say that I don't want to know how they're doing. I use it as a filter for how challenging I think this person may be for whatever I say next. So, yes. hey, you know, Jared, this is Will with whatever company, how's it going or how are you doing? You're going to respond to that. And the tone of voice, how quickly or short you are, how much information you give is going to tell me how quick I need to get to the point with my sales pitch. So if you're a little shorter, I might immediately go in because I don't want to waste your time. If you're a little bit more open, you know, sometimes you call in a particular region where they're like just more friendly. All right, cool. If they're going to be super friendly, I'm going to reciprocate that kind of mirror where they're at. I might not go into my pitch immediately because they're a little bit more open. So I, I like to use it just as a way to feel whether or not this person is willing to have this cold call. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of uh, expressing that. Uh, George, just for the sake of it, uh, what kind of commodities is Will looking to ship in 2024? Will <laughs> Will is not an active broker. Man, uh, I'm he, not looking to ship nothing in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> he, he exited uh, – from Molo and is uh, out there trying to find out his uh, North Star. So uh, that's so good. I am such a fan of that. Uh, you know, Will, obviously you had the from, you know, zero to one and then from one to 50 and then 50 to 100 and, and you took it to a, just a different level. I, I've always been a big believer that, you know, your leadership has ceilings, right? And, yep. and that ceiling essentially ends up becoming your new floor. If you just keep working up, it just kind of becomes the new floor, if you will. And I, I'd be curious to understand, you know, from a business standpoint or from uh, uh, even just, you know, a selfish standpoint of understanding how you maintained your mental health or how you maintained that growth, because you went really large, really quickly. How did you keep exploding your floor up and how did you manage 
your own mental health when you're going through that that level of growth that you did? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to understanding where the business is at the time and what the business needs to be successful. I could break down Molo into, you know, three or four distinct time frames. So you look July 17 through August of 2018, year one, that is true startup growth phase. It's ideation. It is proof of concept. You know, are people going to buy what we're selling? And it's a completely different message in the market. So as a leader, you have to be extremely multifaceted. I am working on operations processes. I'm working on standard HR functions, recruiting. I'm working on training, sales, customer facing sales, carrier facing sales, right? That's the ask. And it probably was the most challenging time from a balance perspective because there's just so many things that need to get done and really no option for them not to get done. So I'd say I probably did a, a mediocre job managing other things outside of the business except for Molo during that time period, just because the ask was so great and the stakes were high. You've got some time to figure out whether or not this is going to be viable. And if you're not willing to commit to it, you're not going to grow and get the growth that you all or that the organization was looking for. So to be like completely transparent, probably did a pretty bad job managing all the other stuff besides Molo, like that first 12 to 18 months. But it's just what you have to do to, to build the business. I would say the next 12 months. So you think july or august of 2018 through 2019 is a lot more maturity so you're now bringing on larger customers you have different types of carriers that want to work with you because you've got a little bit of brand recognition uh, you're starting to have people from a talent perspective join your organization that were not confident that you would be where you are a year before so a lot of people that we tried to recruit year one, year two, joined year three through year six, because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, this is real. Like you all are actually doing this right. But from a leadership perspective, now this is a more stable, mature organization. So what processes need to be in place? How do you stand up the right departments? What leaders need to be on top of those departments in order for them to scale? Because I might have a particular level of expertise as someone that helped found the business, but that doesn't mean that I'm the right individual to lead customer operations or the right person to help scale out the HR and recruiting team, right? You have to go find experts that know how to do those things and equip them with the skills and the, the people to go do that. So as an organization, you're shuffling talent from internal, external, people that built the business, all these things to figure out who's best fit to grow them. Um, and then myself, you know, I'm, I spent a lot of time reading books, reaching out to mentors, you know, going to different conferences and, and seminars just to understand how do you stay sharp? I think I probably did a better job on the leadership growth development piece for like year two through year four, because there's so much more of an ask when the organization gets bigger. Like you go from a 50 person organization to a 250 person organization. You've got to be a significantly better leader to continue to stay in front of those people and, and help them get to where they want to be. So um, long winded answer to say at each version of the business, you have to find out what the business needs in order to move forward so you know the next iteration is you get to the point where you're going to be acquired okay arc best acquires our business you're now part of a large publicly traded organization there's a lot of different things that are involved in that it's significantly more buttoned up right there's more processes involved to really do anything so you've got to be a better more well-rounded business professional to continue to move those things forward so a lot of you i mean there's a lot of learning throughout that process yeah, yeah i can imagine I can I I can't even imagine that scale that quick and uh, how much, yeah 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 you grew probably just through another level. Uh, Josh asks an interesting question: How important is it for brokers to pick up new tools, AI, other software? You know, at the end of the day, there's just a suite of friggin' t softwares out there, right? There's there's a lot of them. There's way more than when you were in in brokering day to day, right? Yeah. You know, how important is it to keep up with, you know, some of these AI trends and then as well as same with softwares, you know, where, where do you see 2024 when it comes to all those different softwares? I'm going to have a very hot take here and this will be from experience. So we built Molo as a pretty simple standard full truckload brokerage. There was not a lot of tech now like technological savvy. We didn't build proprietary software or anything of that nature. We licensed everything and 
you know, we did that, that have the opportunity to use Mastery, which was huge. It's the software that Jeff Silver's building uh, from a TMS perspective. So that helped a lot. But the first three years, we didn't have that, right? You're like building using cloud-based TMS platforms to grow your business. And I say all that to say, you have to be efficient. You have to use tools that allow your people to do more faster. But there are a lot of shiny bells and whistles out there that will distract from the end goal, which is servicing freight well, picking up and delivering loads on time, executing and communicating with customers. And I think it's really easy, or at least it has been in the last three years, to see all these cool things and say, we have to have that. Cost is associated with that. Some of them are similar, right? So you're duplicating effort with the certain software they're using. And I'm not saying don't go use tools to help your team be more efficient. It's extremely important. Just don't lose sight of the end goal, which is to grow the business by adding more logos, driving revenue and profitable net margin to grow the business. You can add all the bells and whistles in the world, but if you don't add new customers, none of that matters. Um, yeah. Likewise, though, you, you do need to find ways to equip your team to do work more effectively. So if you've got a rep that has some sort of a bottleneck from scheduling or load building, sourcing, things of that nature, you should be looking at ways to make your TMS or your software more efficient so that that individual can get more out of what they're doing than a day to day. Because long term, you have to control your costs. And if one individual can produce more, whether it's coverage, they can source more trucks, book more loads, manage more relationships, add more logos, schedule or quote more shipments. Every, sing every single task I just mentioned there has a software provider that I can think of tangibly right now that enhances someone's ability to do that. So you have to super power or supercharge your people to get more with less because it's been a weird environment. Um, it's really, really challenging for people to grow. Um, a lot of people are being squeezed because of margin compression. So you have to find a way to get the most out of you know every single person. Yeah, well put for sure. Uh, Michael had another good question here. Uh, Will, what do the best brokers you've seen do differently than the rest? I think the best brokerages are very, very diligent about the service they provide in the market. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and I think most of transportation companies are kind of commoditized. People are probably going to hate that. But like we call the same carriers, we call the same customers. They want freight picked up and delivered from point A to point B. Fantastic. Um, probably saying the same kinds of things. You know, we don't give loads back. Our team's the best. We got the best service. Okay, great. If you don't pick up and deliver the loads on time, actually, when you get a chance to do it, none of that stuff matters. So I think the best brokerages actually service freight the way that they intend to and do the things that they tell their customers that they will. Because at the end of the day, if you don't do that, your customers are not going to give you any more business and they're going to move it on to someone else that is able to execute. Like, I, I just think it's a, a very simple business, but simple doesn't mean easy, right? Like, how do you get a thousand people to uphold the brand and execute the way that you want to and take care of people and respond to customers in a timely manner? Like, that's really hard. So at scale, it's challenging, but the best do it better than the rest of the field. And that's why they keep winning business. I think it's a very customer service oriented industry. Um, outside of that, I think some of the others that are successful might not be the ones that you see in the spotlight, but they're very niche and focused. So it's OK to have a business that's smaller, profitable and extremely, extremely focused on a particular subset of customers or carriers because it's really hard for people to go and cannibalize your business in that manner. I've got friends that own smaller expedited brokerages or very specialized over dimensional open deck brokerages or extremely tough niche like hazmat freight. They do great and no one's taking their business because it's extremely focused. And I think there's something to be said about, you know, staying true to what your business does well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. At the end of the day, you gotta be, over communicate, you gotta, you know, talk with that shipper and carrier, make sure things are, you know, running smooth, right? Yeah. Um, Jerry, here's another good question from Michael. It's basically for you here, but uh, Jerry said, before you had to connect with customers some way within three weeks after that first contact, mm. um, why so, and what are some tips for connecting with them? Yeah, I think from a sales standpoint, Michael, Michael always brings a lot of sales questions here. I appreciate, mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate him uh, reaching out here. Uh, you know, I think it's important that you get as many touches in a professionally persistent way that you possibly can, right? 
uh, without being the the kind of screaming ex girlfriend or <laughs> well, those guys, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just but but at the same time, those touches need to be value added, in my personal opinion. Um, any way of uh, painting a picture for the environment for a shipping manager or letting them understand things. You know, one of the things that I think uh, right now, if I'm talking to different shipper man shipping managers, you know, uh, rates are extremely competitive right now, and it is not tough to be a shipping manager but will and i have both seen the other side of this when shipping managers are begging for carriers and anybody that has capacity and that swing is going to happen right so the the questions that you got to continue to ask are and i don't know when this swing happens it's going to happen at some point because if we're in a yo-yo environment or yo-yo economics if you will um in my personal opinion you know you're you're asking hey in 2024, how are you going to manage the spot market when it starts to raise and let and start hitting your budget for freight, right? You know, so the, as far as, you know, connecting with customers in a quick way, I, I don't necessarily know if it's a three week manner, but I would, I'm always in a prospecting setting. I'm always trying to hit as much value. Will, I'm open if you have any other thoughts uh, when it comes to, to pipeline management. One of the things you mentioned is professional persistence. I think that's important. There's a difference between being irritating and being yes. persistent. So, yeah. you know, you might reach out to someone a couple of times in the first month and you space it out, you know, however many business days you'd like to space that out. Uh, if they're not reciprocating, you have to either figure out a way to present something to them that's valuable enough to get them going, or you have to find someone else in the org that has any type of, of say and intrigue them, you know, create some sort of internal buy-in so that they help push you up and, and get you moving forward. But most of the time it's going to be timing and not really what you're doing. Like they've got a ton of providers that are already successfully executing freight. It's not really hard to move freight today. Like someone tell me why they need to onboard you. The answer is like, they don't, they got a billion people calling them and they got a billion people moving their freight. But if you are professionally persistent and you provide value and by value, I mean, is there any information you're giving them that they don't know? Is there something about how you service freight or what you do for that particular style of customer that's unique that they should take you know time to listen to um, mm -hmm. when they need you or there's an opportunity for you to crack in there they're going to value the fact that you've been around long enough and persistent enough to stay in front of them but you can't be irritating like you can't call them every single day you can't send an email every day your emails can't be bad right that stuff will all get you disqualified yeah yeah, honestly, I mean, you can get some crazy. I think I think right now there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of noise in in the pipeline management right now, and uh, you know people are definitely not adding as much value because they're desperate to save their companies or or those things. And I think if they change their mindset to help people get to their goals, they'll get to theirs. You know, so yeah, um, big fan of that. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Thomas threw it in at Hubforce. It's crazy. It's crazy technology. Yeah. Um, Josh says, what are some of the issues you see brokers facing that could be solved with technology? Are there, are there bottlenecks that you recognized uh, as you were in that seat from a, a leadership standpoint that, that could be solved? I think some of what we mentioned earlier is important to consider. So you have really good providers out there that help with carrier sourcing. I think one of the largest issues that a lot of brokers have is just data management and being able to visualize what their data looks like. So whether it is from a sourcing perspective, like which carriers are running what lanes, you'd be surprised how many TMS platforms don't give you good visibility over what is actually happening at a load level. It's like really hard to pull that data out. So just from an execution perspective, if you can find ways to say, okay, how do we expose better data to help the team source carriers more effectively? That's extremely helpful. Are there certain things that you can do to eliminate some monotonous tasks, whether that be scheduling or data entry, or whether that be track and trace, like all of those things allow people to go do more high value activity that drives revenue and allows the team to grow. We won't say that, you know, it's unimportant to do data entry or unimportant to look at certain things, but if you can expedite that process, and make it easier for someone to do, you can put them on different tasks that allow you to drive your business forward. So I think about as many systematic monotonous tasks as possible. And, and this is for any business, not just outside of brokerage, right? Like if you can allow your people to spend more time driving revenue, the business is going to be more successful. Mm, I love that. 
Uh, Will, obviously, uh, I love your content. You bring a lot of value to the market, um, and I appreciate that a lot. You're getting ready to jump back out into the workspace here a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, can you tease us a little bit? At least uh, let us know where where we can find you and what's going on in your world. Yeah. So I left Molo in May of 2023. So this was about 18 months after ArcVest purchased us, and you know, I was in my mind time to go figure out what I wanted to go build next. And I felt really good about what we had the opportunity to build at Molo, and you know, have incredible relationships with the team at ArcVest and, and the team at Molo. And, you know, I was sitting down one day, I said, man, you know, I think, I think this is it. I think it's time for me to go uh, take some time to figure out what I want to want to go build next. So I spent the summer traveling, um, kind of ideating on what I wanted to work on. Um, I was bopping around Europe. It was at a really, a really good time to just clear the head and figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, I have figured that out. I'm not ready to launch um, publicly quite yet, but I do have a handful of clients I'm working with directly today. Um, you know, it's not a broker, just not in the brokerage spaces. I um, will be out of that for a bit right now. But, you know, I'm excited about being able to really help a handful of, of tight knit relationships I have um, develop the right processes and, and grow their organizations in a way that helps differentiate what they do against the rest of the players. Um, I think there's a lot of things I had the opportunity to learn while building and scaling Molo that are valuable, uh, you know, outside of just the standard brokerage, transactional, you know, transactional space of brokering freight. Um, and so as I have the opportunity to expose a little bit more of what it is, uh, I'm excited to kind of bring it to y'all uh, probably about two weeks away from launching publicly. But I am actively working on the business now and, and I've got a couple of clients that are pretty happy with what's going on. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. if you uh, if you haven't, if you're watching today, uh, connect with Will Jenkins on LinkedIn because he'll fill your cup every day. And I hope uh, somebody fills your cup, Will. Um, yeah. I really enjoy uh, the content you bring and, and what you do. And I'm excited for your journey here that as you start it again. So thank you. And you met, you asked where people can connect with me. LinkedIn. I'm also pretty active on Twitter. It's Will Jenkins, WCJ. And then my personal website is just willjenkinswcj.com. Uh, my email is will at willjenkinswcj.com. So pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, feel free to reach out. I you know take as many calls as I can with people in the space um, just to build great relationships. And I've had really good mentors and people that helped me for no reason the last 10 years of my career in transportation. So if I can be a resource for somebody or just foster a relationship, I'm always for it. I love that. You know, something just really random. And I know obviously we're kind of wrapping up here, but I love that you understand when it's time for you to take time to reflect. Uh, you obviously have done that multiple times in your life, um, you know, once prior to starting, you know, Molo and then once after Molo. And um, I, I think it's one of the best kept secrets when it comes to just trying to understand where you need to go and your purpose in life. I really do. I'm a big fan. I love how you clear your head, kind of do those things. Um, what a wonderful, uh, just, I, just, I love that process, man. I appreciate that. I think it's been helpful to stay focused, come back sharp. Like right now I am the most focused and motivated I've been in quite some time. And I think that comes because I enjoy building businesses. I'm an entrepreneur at heart and having the opportunity to go build something is always exciting, but I don't know that I would feel that way had I not given myself a chance to step back and unplug, which I think is important. You can do that and know small pockets of time whether it be over the weekend or you know kind of keeping yourself sharp with different things that take you out of your business um, i have some i want to be a little bit more diligent about because i think it helps me stay more whole and focused um, but it's definitely a big part of, of staying sharp yeah i love that uh last question from the audience and then we'll uh, we'll wrap her up here michael says did all the greatest sales people you've seen on the phone have similar style are the best of the best all similar people and style uh, you know, what were some traits that you saw or character traits that you saw from some of these people? I actually posted about this a few months ago. I think the best salespeople I've had in my career, the opportunity to work with are all very different. And I think they use what they understand about the business, what they understand about their customers and their natural skill set to be successful. So I've had reps that are very forward on the phone, like they've got a little bit more of a direct tone. They don't really do the rapport building, but it works for them. That's never worked for me. I, I am more of the 
let me present some information, ask good questions, build some rapport. I'll get to the same end result. We just take a different path. I've also had reps that have never been really good on the phone, but are incredible at writing good emails that get good responses. And a lot of times they end up outperforming some people that as long as they get to the end goal of adding new customers and building their book of business, I don't really care how you go about it, right? So what I've noticed is the best people use the skill set they have and then take things from other people that they find are helpful. So you know, maybe they learn how to write good emails because they're killer on the phone and they want to add their pipeline that way. Or they spend some time sharpening up their phone skills because they can't get to a decision maker on an email, but they've got to figure out a way to get them going on the phone. Um, but generally speaking, I haven't noticed that there's one skill set or type of person that's more successful. I do think there are certain traits, work ethic, persistence, I think coachability, the ability to present well in front of people, building relationships, things of that nature that aren't like, you know, hey, this person's outgoing or they're, you know, more aggressive, right? I don't think those things necessarily correlate to success in sales. I think it's understanding how do you present the value of your business? And then how do you be authentic with who you are and use those things together to, to move an opportunity forward? Yeah, absolutely. I had a guy uh, today actually tell me this is kind of an interesting comment. He said, uh, he said, you know, right now it's almost impossible to get a client. You know, everybody's flooded with calls. Pipelines are really just overbearing. But he said, he goes, what I'm really focused on is just getting better at cold calling because when it does turn around, I'll be one of the best. So he's just focusing on just sharpening the iron right now because he said it's it's like the gauntlet. You know, yeah. you're just you're in the ring, you know, just the ring. And let's just go and get hit until we can't get up anymore. And uh, it was kind of an interesting comment. So I loved I loved that mentality. Um, Will, thank you for being on the show today, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, you, you brought thank the you. house. You do what you do. And, and I wish you the best in the future. Uh, Nate, close us out, man. Yeah, no, thanks again, Will. You know, one thing I definitely... Like I said, you're a breath of fresh, fresh air. So everyone, make sure to link up with him. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll tune into us next week. Well, we'll probably have to have you on in 2024. Just catch up. You know, we'll stay in touch, obviously. Yeah. But thanks again. Um, everyone have a good weekend and be safe out there. Awesome. Thank you for having me.